Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Luis Duarte. I'm here to speak today some stuff about hardening an infrastructure with a vault. So, a bit about myself. I'm a software engineer as a profession and an open source contributor. I have a bachelor degree from, uh, in computer science and computer engineering from uh, Isel. And these are my handles in uh, some of the mostly known social networks in case you want to get in touch. So, beginning this presentation, what's the secret? According to the dictionary, it's something not known or not to be seen by others. Uh, something you, sh you shouldn't share, something everybody has, something crucial for business in this case. So, how can you store your secrets? You can either use text files, I I've used them, I was a started my career as a systems administrator, I used text files to do that. Uh, typically nowadays you use password managers like ePass, LastPass, some uh, you can use a post-it sticker and uh, stick it on your monitor, which is not very safe. I did it in the past, so... You can do a notebook handwriting, so it's like a book of secrets, but it's advisable to lock it away on the cabinet below your desk. I did this on the previous company I've worked at for security reasons. And a Git repository. Typically, you use the Git repository on infrastructure as code, stuff like Chef, Puppet. You, you, you need to store secrets somewhere in order for the infrastructure to get deployed. So, the, which, which leads me to the question, how do companies nowadays think about secrets? How, how do they manage them? This was intentionally left blank because from my experience, I've worked the past couple of years in software engineering, but in cybersecurity, I've noticed that companies don't have, how should I say, don't have a plan to tackle how they share passwords. They simply have Git repository with, with the, the chef cookbooks. They have all the passwords there. They control it by, by, by access, like for example, only the, only the DevOps team has access to the Git repository. This works pretty well when you're a small company, a small startup company, but when you start to grow up, imagine that you, you have some problems with an employee, you, you terminate the employee, things end bad, he still has access to your credentials. It, it's a bit of a pain to manage this. Like I said, when you're small, it shouldn't, uh, it's easy to manage, but when you start to grow, it starts becoming a problem. Which, uh, after you have, for example, let's say, data breach, something like this happens. You start by, okay, don't panic, it should be easy, it's just some data that went to Pastebin or the dark web, oh, okay. Then when you start tackling the problem, Imagine that you have you start having lots of services, for example, 20 services, and you start thinking of the things you need to revoke, things you need to change, the things you need to harden. Typically, typically that's when you start going to think about these problems, when you're going to tackle them, is after you've been attacked, after you have a data breach, and this is not good. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that you should be aware, you should have some kind of how, how to tackle these issues with the, the data breaches. So, situations like this don't happen. Have your, your product w like this for like, let's say, three days. Because nowadays, I, th I believe that data, as they said in the op opening keynote, data is the new oil. And companies, if you're a small startup, you need to have, to, to, for you to grow, you need, you need to have trust. Most companies need to trust you, are going to trust you, their data, and they are going to pay for it. This, is, this, this relation is similar with money with a bank. You have money in a bank, if the, bans, the bank starts ha having problems, what will happen? You'll take the money out of the bank. Same thing happens with your product. Uh, customers will just start wondering, okay, uh, what, did I make the right choice in choosing this product or this startup as my business partner? They're going to start asking that questions, and if you can avoid that, 
the, the better. So, lesson one, always have a plan in case of data breach and react fast because every, every second that it passes after you had a data breach, the worse it's going to be for you. Always have a, a contingency plan. What should you do in case of a data breach? You need to revoke all the users, change database host names. This is not required, but personally, I would do it because if a hacker, let's say uh, an, in an intruder, knows where your database is, th that's typically not good because you know it's like firing a gun. At least you know the location. He's somewhere around there. You're just going to start firing at it, brute force attacks, DDoS. It's not good when this happens. Uh, after you revoke everything, you should create new users and passwords. So you just start clean, like uh, key rolling. Uh, and after that, you need to reconfigure all your infrastructure with new data, just restarting all your infrastructure with the new credentials. And this sometimes can be a pain if you, let's say, if you have two or three services, should be fine. But if you have like 10, 20, you start growing up a lot. It can be a bit painful to do. Deploy new cookbooks, execute the new cookbooks. It, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain. Now, how many people here work with infrastructure as a code, uh, have a startup with infrastructure as a code? Right. And I bet you all have the same problem. You need to store the secret somewhere. But uh, 10 years ago, this wasn't a problem, because you owned the physical machines. It means you own the infrastructure. You didn't have this problem. You could just have the configuration files laying there. You didn't have this problem because the infrastructure was yours, physically yours. Nowadays, it's a bit different. You only code it. You code the infrastructure, and it's run somewhere, typically Amazon, Heroku, uh, OpenShift. And that can be a problem because it's like, for, <coughs> sorry, uh, if you have a, a, a chef cookbook, means you have uh, your secrets stored in a Git repository. One of the things that uh, auditing companies, cybersecurity auditing companies do, is take a, look, is, uh, take a look of all your Git repositories and search for patterns. And that's one more attack vector that you need to worry about. OK, who has access to my code? That, that, that's, how should I say it? The, Trust me, when you have a data breach, you'll know what I'm saying. <laughs> OK, so this comes me to introduce you a tool called Vault by HashiCorp. Disclaimer, I'm not a HashiCorp employee. I'm just aligned with their vision about nowadays infrastructures as a code. They develop a lot of tools to aid you with infrastructure as a code. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about Vault. Integrates with other tools that they have, like Console, Terraform, all that stuff. But for now, I'm going to focus on Vault. And I advise you to, I recommend that you go visit the website, check out their stuff. It's really cool stuff, really small stuff, tackle small issues. It's recommended. So, what does Vault feature? <coughs> you can generate secrets dynamically. It does, meaning it does key rolling for you. You can, for example, have one hour passwords with expiration. Imagine uh, a colleague of mine that I don't want him to have access to production. I can give him read access for 15 minutes, automatically being revoked after that, those 15 minutes. Typically, how would you do? Somebody asks access in production, you would give him, then you tell him, oh, when you're finished, let me know so I delete this. This tool makes it, does it for you. Uh, it, it encrypts the data, uh, meaning any secrets that you have there are encrypted. They are, uh, I believe they are cached in a volume, in a disk. I'm not sure, but I believe they can be stored in a database, but everything is encrypted. It supports access control lists. It, support, it uh, supports leasing, renewing, revocation, does this automatically for you. And above all, in my opinion, this is the best feature Vault has. It has an audit log, which means every action you do in Vault, you can log to the system log, allowing you for having SIAM, SIAM systems, which are used by security engineers and security researchers to detect ab uh, uh, abnormal activity within your infrastructure. 
For example, imagine that you have a, you have a token issue, um, an application token, sorry, <laughs> my bad. You have an application token issued to some of the microservices. They have a rate, like they do five requests per 10 minutes, but suddenly you start getting bursts at Vault to get credentials using that token. Typically, SIAM, SIAM systems will warn the, the security engineers that something abnormal is right. There's a, an, uncommon raise, an un uncommon spike in requesting credential access. This is not good. It helps you in, in that way. It helps you prevent, uh, detect if there's something wrong with, with the, the security of your credentials. <clears throat> It also authenticates with more multiple third party, multiple third party providers. Authenticates with Okta, Google OAuth, OAuth 2, authenticates with AWS, authenticates with a lot of things. Can have username and password authentication, application tokens, which they call application roles, uh, integrates with application tokens, which you can easily you, you can easily manage this in Vault. You don't have to worry about authentication. And last but not, but not least, it's all encapsulated in a REST API, which means it's easily integratable with your infrastructure. Imagine this like a uh, REST API, se secret management as a service, uh, encapsulated by REST API. This is the, the main architecture. So you have the API, you have the token store, uh, for each request, you need a token. You need a token for everything, to do everything here. Uh, it has a policy store, but I'll show you a demo later after this. The path routing is like, uh, this works like uh, key, value product, key, key value pairs. It's like you define a path, you, for that path, you configure uh, a backend, either a secret backend, which is used to generate secrets on demand, or a credential backend, which is used for authentication. The system backend, for example, is locked down to slash system. It's, it's, it's locked down. And then you can have multiple audit backends, which means you can lock to syslog, you can lock to a normal log, you can create your own logger. It's also extensible. But for that, I'll, I'll uh, redirect you to the, to the API and how to develop a plugin. So when you start Vault in production, starts sealed. Sealed means you can't do anything on it. It's impossible. And to unseal it, it uses a technique called the Shamir secret algorithm, which splits the master key that's used to unseal it in uh, several shared keys. And you can even configure a threshold. For example, in, the, in, this, uh, in this image, you have the master key split into five shared keys. You can set a threshold of three, which means you only need three keys, three shared keys, input to rebuild the master key, which with, with that master key will unlock the encryption key. Every, all of this is done in memory. So there's no, it's not stored anywhere. So, secret backends that you support. It, it automatically generates SSH credentials. For example, you need to access a production machine. OK, I will generate for you, let's say, a username and a password so you can access that machine for like 15 minutes, automatically revocable. And you can configure if the tokens you issue for that SSH machine are renewable and for how long. You can, it has the, the databases, which it, it needed to have. It also does certificates, uh, PKI rolling for you. Also does key value store. Uh, dynamically generates AWS credentials for you. Pretty useful when you want somebody to access, for example, uh, an S3 bucket production, read only, just for 15 minutes. So you make sure that that, that data, that, that username is not leaked. It can be leaked, but okay, after 15 minutes, that username will stop to exist. It won't exist anymore. It also integrates with RabbitMQ, creates usernames, passwords for RabbitMQ. It also supports multiple databases, but you need to, if this is a REST API with path routing, by default it will, it will use several paths, but if you want to set up multiple databases, you just need to, to add a parameter saying, where do you want to mount this backend? I'll show you in a, in a demo. In, the, in this demo, 
going to focus on the databases because I, I wanted to show you AWS, which in my opinion is awesome. Just create an IAM role and it will generate new roles for you with the, with the, the access properties that you define. It's pretty awesome, but we're short on time, so I need to, to get this to the databases. This is a small example. HashiCorp comes, the uh, vault, sorry, comes with a command line interface, which is basically a wrapper for the REST API. You can interact with either directly through the REST API, or you can interact via the command line interface. So how do we spin this off? We just, like I said before, you log in. After you log in, you're going to be issued a token. And with that token, you start doing operations. Let me see if I put you. You see here? Uh, no, I didn't put the header. It was my bad. This slide is wrong. Disregard it, please. So the mentality here is tokens everywhere. You generate a token for everything. And that token can be renewable or not. It has a time to live. It, it's very, very highly configurable. And which this leads to. This was how this was created, fundamental theory of, of software engineering. You solve everything by adding another level of indirection. This is exactly what HashiCorp did. They added an, another level of indirection. You're still with the uh, 12 flaws of distributed systems, but if you have a distributed systems, you already have it, so what's one more service? So I have a small demo. I'm going to check if this works. Can you guys see the, the font? You want me to increase it? OK, I'll give it a try. Give me a second. Sorry, my Mac broke down last week. I'm not used to Windows. This trip down memory lane. OK, Vault, by default, I'm using the Docker image. It will, use, it will generate just one and seal key. When you bootstrap Vault, it will generate based on the configuration you give them. If you give them five, it will generate five unsealed keys. These are supposed to be given to, for example, you have five release engineers, you have five keys. Distributed, you distribute through all of them. And this is the root token. Uh, from my experience, root token, the moment you set this up in production, create your own root user, <laughs> delete this token. It's, this is a major flaw if you keep using the, the root token. OK, so, OK. Uh, OK, so, have vault, the command line here. Let me just put in some stuff here. OK, this is needed because of Docker. You need to set this IP, a wildcard. I never understood why, but OK. You have two options of logging into Vault. You can either use the environment variable, Vault underscore token, or if you do a Vault login, it will ask for you. It will ask you for the token. So now I'm going to mount. The database endpoint, uh, database backend. See, if you need to mount another database, you see the dash path. Okay, you have another. We instantiated uh, another plugin, but to another path. This with this you can configure multiple, multiple, for example, Postgres servers or uh, MySQL servers. Now we need to configure a role. Let's hope that. Like I said, sorry, trip down memory line. You give it the creation statement when you're creating the role. This is the database role specific to Vault with this creation statement. You can also do the update statement, the delete statement. You can customize everything. It uses, I believe it's must, I don't know if it's mustache, mustache templates or Google Go templates. I, I, I still haven't figured that out. They're pretty similar, but if you can see, you, this is the creation statement for each user, meaning for every time you request access to the database, it will create a user with this query. 
and it will have a default time to live for one hour, max time to live 24 hours. Means you can renew that um, can renew this token until it reaches 24 hours. 24 hours later, this access is disabled. It's completely completely deleted from the database. This this is the the key rolling I was talking to you about. It allows you to configure the way you want to do your key rolling strategy. Okay, it's written. Now I need to configure Postgres. Oh, sorry. Keep forgetting that. Uh, keep forgetting that this isn't a Mac. Okay. You define the plugin name. It supports MySQL, Oracle. I'm, I'm not sure. In the previous version, they only supported Oracle. In the enterprise version, I'm not sure if they already supported it in the community version. But I need to take a look at the documentation. Uh, you're saying here that uh, this database, meaning this uh, backend, the, the allowed roles that can do can do the, that can you can create users is the read-only, the one see I created above, and I put okay, and I I okay, and you put the connection string with uh, an admin user with, um, I'm sorry, I'm failing, uh, with permissions, I was missing the word, with permissions where you can create another users. So it's basically an indirection. You configure with the user, then it generates another users. Okay, see, well, it's giving me an access that I should create a, a policy, an access control list to, to this, so not every user, not every token has access to this, can create users on this, but we'll get there later. Okay, so now, see this? Created a lease, duration one hour. I can renew it by issuing, and I can't remember, I think it's the token renew or lease renew. I, I can't quite remember now. But uh, you can renew, meaning telling Vault, okay, don't delete these credentials, I'm still using them. This is the, the password. And the username, uh, I need to create another bash. Sorry, keep forgetting this isn't a Mac. I think it's this. No, not PG users. PG users, see? Users created here. Token, read only, and some weird stuff. This is, this is using the latest feature from Postgres. You can add expiration on users. Vault will do that automatically for you. Okay, extend. Okay, now you see Windows. Sorry, some technical difficulties. This is what happens when you don't do a presentation on a Mac. Okay, which leads me to the next slide, which is the ACLs that I was talking to you about. How do you control access to what, uh, who has access, access to what, and for how long? So, these are the features you, uh, I was talking to you about before. This is the feature I'm going to speak about now. The, you can write access control lists, either in JSON or HashiCorp configuration language, which is like more clean JSON. I don't know why people keep inventing new standards. We're just going to have more standards. Uh, default policy, meaning if you don't add a policy for read, imagine on a path, a, spe a specific pathing, 
it will be denied by default. I mean, you don't have to worry, oh, I forgot to add that, and they will have access to that read access. No, you just don't have access. You only have access to what you want them to have access, so to speak. All token policies are atomic, meaning you can create a policy, generate a token based on that policy, and you, if, if you update your policy or uh, associate new policies to that, uh, to, to that authentication, you need to issue new tokens, which means they are atomic. You, you, don't, need to worry to, you don't need to worry that past, people, past tokens will have access to They won't have access to it. It's basically telling you, OK, you updated the policies, now restart your microservices just to get new tokens with the vault. This allows you to get a fine-grained control on how to share your secrets. This is an, uh, an example uh, of a policy. It's written in a HashiCorp configuration language. It's pretty similar to JSON. As you can see, you're adding that path secret slash foo, which you wrote secret secrets to it, like a key value store. You, you are giving it the capabilities to create, update, read, or delete. And you are denying any requests where you try to set bar as the key, which means if you do a vault write secret slash foo, with bar equals something, this request is going to be denied. Because you, you're telling here, you're not allowed to set, to set these par parameters. Imagine that you want to give read access to a software engineer or to a developer. He can add more fields, but those fields that you created, no, you won't touch them. You, you even have that, that, uh, that control. This is very fine-grained control. And you can allow all parameters. You can write to any, to any field as long as the value starts with foo. And uh, another disclaimer, these are not regular expressions. It only supports wildcards, I believe, in the beginning at the end. So now I'm going to do a demo with the ACL. Uh, duplicate. God, I hate Windows. Where was I? OK, here we are. So I'm going to create policy here. See, I'm going to create a policy here. Ah. My bad. I'm doing a request to the REST API, the only way you can do this, you can add new policies, is literally upload a new file. I tried it via the command line, do inline, but you need to really upload the file. So it's done, OK. It's like a put. The policy is already there. I believe it's vault policies. Yeah, see here? It's created. Now, best way to test out a uh, policy is using token create. Token create will create a temporary token with the policies that you, you can give him. Associate, you can associate those policies with that token. So I'm going to create a, a token with the default policy. Oh, and I forgot something. Um, OK, wrote the secret. Uh, sorry, vault login. Uh, sorry. OK, we are now locked. OK, this is the part where I hide, because OK, now, this, this is really the part where I hide. Let me check my notes. OK, this is the part where I hide. I don't know why this is happening. Now you're probably all laughing. OK, this is the, this is the token. Really sorry. Uh, vault off. Why am I with root token? It shouldn't, it shouldn't be the root token. The token. Uh, 
probably this one. Okay, don't know what's going on. I believe now it's the right time to say it used to work on my machine. Okay, vault read secret slash food. Permission denied means I don't have access to it. So vault off. This is the root token I've created. I'll just just use the backup plan. I hate Windows. <sighs> okay. See here? Now, where is it? Where is it? Ah, now I'm going to create. Token, a token associated with the newly created policy. Okay, now vault off. Yeah, probably. We'll assume the root token. No worries. Sorry about this. Little bump in the road. Now. I have the new token. See? Now I can access it. This is how policies work. Uh, little recommendation. Don't make policies too large, otherwise it can easily become a big mess. Uh, how much time do we still have? 28 minutes? Okay. Oh, I believe we, st we still have time. Oh, sorry. This is me panicking, sorry. First time in a big stage. For the... App roles. This is what you should do. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Sorry about this. My bad. I'm ruining your experience. Mine as well. Okay. I'm going to enable the app role. This is typically used in microservices. You're going to generate a role ID and a secret ID. This secret ID can have an expiration, means, meaning, for example, you can only use it two times. See, I've enabled the app role. You can mount them at different paths, so it's easy for you to, to manage, so you can have multiple configurations and multiple backends con configured. As you can see here, the secret IDs generated for this app role will have a 10 minutes time to live, maximum. The token, tokens can be used 10 times maximum. The to each token has a 20 minutes time to leave. The renewable, uh, the renew the lease, each token can have, a it's renewable up to 30 minutes. The secret, secret ID, each secret ID is only usable twice. And it's associated with the newly created policy. Now, I'm going to read the role ID. This is the role ID. I'm going to tell Vault, okay, generate a secret ID for this role. Generated the secret ID. This is what you will be configuring on your microservices, just the, um, the role ID and the secret ID. It will log in into Vault using the role ID and secret ID. Then it will, it will start issuing tokens associated to credentials. They call it leases. Let me give you an example. Jesus. See this? Okay. Here's the tokens. This is, there are libraries that already implement all these transactions. I'm only showing you what they do underlying. For example, Spring Boot recently released the, the, Spring, the Spring Cloud Vault into the new, the, the new release train for the, the Spring Cloud framework. They already support Vault out of the door, so it's pretty simple to support this. 
and it you can automatically associate it with Spring properties. It's pretty easy. You don't need configuration files anymore, only to store the role IDs and the secret IDs. So if I do this twice, and the third time, it will give an invalid, because I told him, you can only generate two secret IDs for this role. You don't generate anymore. You can only use them twice. OK. Close. Extending. Sorry, guys. Windows. Sorry to the Microsoft guys. OK. This, these are some tips. What should you do in case of a data breach? First of all, don't panic. The moment you start panicking, you start making mistakes. And you already made one mistake by allowing an attacker to get inside your infrastructure. Uh, don't Try not to make more mistakes. So for that, don't panic. Think calm. Just uh, do what I usually do when I'm panicking. Usually I get up, uh, go to the... Um, Go to the bottom floor, g give a turn around the corner, like twice until I cool off, then I go back in. You should only seal the vault in case of emergency. If uh, an intruder is deep inside, if, the, if you think they are deep inside, seal the vault immediately. Yes, all your microservices, all the new tokens, the new leases, everything will stop working, but it's best to just shut it down. It's like, shut down, don't do anything. Revoke all the tokens. I believe if you restart Vault, he, he will do automatically for you. And generate new, new tokens like secret IDs, role IDs, just key roll everything. This, uh, an, another remark I like to do is negligence is always going to happen. It's always going to happen. Uh, Vault isn't going to solve all your security problems. It will just make harder for intruders to get inside your infrastructure. So, OK, it helps, but negligence will still happen, and you need to be looking out for it. As best practices, I, like I said before, I recommend access control lists, the policies, keep them small. Otherwise, you can easily become a big mess. Uh, you can use token create in development, in development mode, so you don't need to do all those manual steps to log in as a user. Yeah, you can just test out. It's pretty easy. Uh, every new policy changes just restart the containers so they get the new tokens with the new permissions. And this is the most important of all. Just destroy the automatically generated root token in production and generate your own, your own principles with root policy. Don't use the root token ever. And last but not least, Make sure the default policy, I forgot to mention, Vault comes with a default policy. Make sure it has, has access to nothing. Because by default, it will create a token with, with the default policy. The default policy should not have access to anything critical. Source code for this presentation will be present here when I upload it to GitHub. So after the bumps in the road, now is probably the best time. I hide. Any questions? Please be gentle on me. I guess I don't need to hide. Be gentle. Hi. Thanks for the great presentation. I just like it, like it a lot. Um, <laughs> How about uh, how do you deal with legacy applications that uh, need to communicate with Vault? Do you use the REST API? I know that Spring uh, Cloud automatically mm -hmm. configures those, those things for you, but how do you deal with a uh, simple Node.js application that reads from a config file? Uh, there are packages, uh, to my knowledge. The community has packages that integrates with Vault. Or you can just manually create your own, just do the requests through a REST API. It's just a simple HTTP request. I recommend using the libraries. Otherwise, it's going to be a bit painful. OK. 
because you need to manage all this. You need to manage, for example, the, um, the, the time to lease. You need to control all of that. You need to expect errors. And to, if, you, if you get an error on a token, you need to verify it. OK, uh, has the lease expired? No, it hasn't expired. Then I know I need to, to get a new token. On legacy, I recommend that you use the, the libraries. I think they have at their website in the documentation. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I believe they have for Node.js. For now, for, for, currently, for all I know, since I'm a mostly Java developer, they have on Spring Cloud, out of the box. OK, thanks. Oh, god. Well, yes, everybody understood this. So, thanks, everyone. Sorry about those little bumps in the road. I, I believe I can invoke the work before on my machine argument, but you're not going to buy it. So, thanks for uh, bringing up to this. Thanks for your time. <laughs>